And then happy to introduce uh, Ruiz Cronin from our project Roots of Europe at Copenhagen University, who will speak about the linguistic heritage of the European Neolithic. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, my lecture will, yeah, like I said, it says it about some uh, lexical elements within the Germanic languages that I believe have uh, a Neolithic origin. And the, the main uh, stage on which the, the problem lies is, uh, well, it's, it's somewhere in, in between two prehistoric revolutions. And uh, the first uh, revolution is the, the uh, advent of agriculture from the, the Middle East, the first the cres crescent. Uh, that's well, uh, agriculture moved up from there all, all the way to Scandinavia, as, all, as you all might know. And the other one is the, 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 the European invasion of uh, uh, Northwest Europe, resulting in the, the rise of the, well, not, a, not just the Germanic languages, but also other Indo European languages. So this, let's just start with that. Um, so uh, the Indo European, in the Europeanization of Europe is often links to the archaeological uh, Kyrgyzization of Europe. This is not entirely uh, uh, without, uh, uh, not, not entirely uncontroversial, uh, but uh, nevertheless can I use it here? Because, well, it might be, might actually be uh, useful. So what you see, you might see here is the intrusion of the Indo-European peoples into uh, uh, Europe, and uh, as you might see, the, there's almost a straight line steps to uh, the homeland of homeland of uh, Germanic, Proto-Germanic. So, uh, as you will know, the Indo-European invasions ultimately resulted in into uh, the, the settlement of Europe by Indo-European peoples, and yeah, they also spoke other languages, of course. So, what uh, you get by the dawn of uh, history is uh, several different Indo-European branches: uh, Celtic, Italian, Greek, Slavic, Avar, Tatar. Germanic in the north, and uh, well, with the exception of Basque, uh, all previously spoken languages seem to have died out. So this this was a very successful colonization wave, because uh, all the previously existing uh, culture or cultures or these languages uh, ultimately went extinct. So uh, my sub my uh, expertise is mainly. Uh, Germanic languages. The Germanic uh, was uh, the, home, the Germanic homeland was situated in uh, Scandinavia, now there with Germany, some two thousand years <coughs> ago. From there, um, yeah, it spread somewhat more to the west and the south, and also to the north, uh, re resulting into the modern Germanic languages, uh, as you see them see them here: Norwegian, Swedish, Persian, English, Dutch, and German and Danish. So what, uh, what am I doing, uh, what have I been doing as a linguist? That's basically um, collecting all the linguistic or lexical material from these uh, languages and their predecessors so as to um, reconstruct the Germanic pro proto-language. So by comparing lexical material from these languages, you can um, yeah, create a picture of the proto-language, which is not attested. It was spoken some 2,000 years ago in Denmark. Um, and well, uh, this is the, this resulted one of the, uh, one of the results of this process is an uh, etymological et etymological dictionary, Proto Germanic. Uh, I found out actually it's it's online now. So at Brill's uh, website, you can if you have a subscription, you can actually look up uh, Germanic words. Um, um, what are the conclusions I arrived at after this? Or during this process, is, is that actually uh, well, Germanic is uh, clearly an Indo-European language. <laughs> this is of course, of course, not very new because it's it's obviously uh, derived from uh, Indo-European. But um, there is also a component within the Germanic lexicon that cannot be traced to uh, the Indo-European proto-language, and I have estimated this share. Fifteen percent, or something. The main difference, or the main differences between these two categories, is that, well, in the case in the case of Indo-European words, you find a lot of cognates or 
related words in other Indo-European languages, and not just in European languages, but also in, for instance, Old Indic or Armenian. And then another feature of these words is that the sound correspondences are regular. So for instance, if you have an, an F in Germanic, you will find a P in all other uh, languages, or languages like Greek and Latin and Sanskrit. And this, this principle of regularity uh, holds in, in this category, category of words, whereas in the other category, it, it doesn't. So the, in these 15, in this, yeah, these 15 percent uh, unclear origin words, um, what you often see if, is that they have very few cognates in the in other in, in other in the European languages. When they have cognates, they are often only found in their neighboring uh, in the European uh, languages, and uh, very often the sound correspondences are irregular. So they are in breach or in violation with the regularity of yeah, the, the principle that we call the regular regularity of a sound change. So that's important. So this is actually a, a feature. You can check the whole lexicon on ir irregular features, and when you do so, well, you can get a very interesting picture. So let's just take an example. Um, the carrot case. Um, well, this is one of the words that belongs to the 15% category. It's only attested in Germanic, Slavic, and maybe Greek. And uh, when you look at this Germanic and Slavic corresponding cognates, you see that well, Germanic, the, the Germanic words end, uh, starts with M, whereas in Slavic they have both M and B. Um, and this is very problematic. This is normally not the case in words derived from Indo-European. An M should stay in M and a B should stay B. Um, but yeah, they should not uh, well, get mixed up. So this is a, a feature, this, this, this already makes you wonder what's going on here. Uh, I don't know if you're able, if you're able to see it, but uh, I have mapped these cognates on uh, the, the natural occurrence of the violence carrot from which the carrot was uh, derived. And well, as you may notice, uh, that this distribution uh, is spread as well outside the European homeland. So it's of course not very surprising that exactly this word doesn't seem to be Indo-European because the Indo-Europeans probably didn't know what it was. So they only came into contact with it when they moved to Western Europe. So the idea is that actually the when the Indo-Europeans moved away from them, their homeland, deeper into Europe, Western Europe, they uh, yeah, became acquainted with this new concept of carrots and then they borrowed the word. And when they borrowed the word, they probably did, did it independently. So Germanic did it and Slavic did it, but not at the same time, and they did it differently. And this explains why you have these well, irregular features, or irregular correspondences. Um, people have speculated about, of course, uh, what kind of language there could have been in Europe, uh, or languages. Well, uh, one option is Basque. Of course, we know that Basque is uh, not in European language, it's still alive. So why not, why not assume that it was, um, it's, well, yeah, it, was it, co it, it covered a larger area than it does today? Uh, another possibility is uh, that it was a language related to, to Semitic. It's one of the closest uh, language families, of the language families closest to uh, well, Indo European, I guess, geographically. Another option is uh, if Finnish has been suggested. Uh, the fourth option, of course, is an unknown language. So, in this, to my mind, this is the most probable probable scenario, because if we assume that um, Europe before the invasion of the Europeans was as, was as rich linguistically as it is today, uh, yeah, many languages must have disappeared. That's a priori more likely, I think, that we are dealing with one of those languages than that we're dealing with a language that's still still exists, or that is, has continuance. Um, well, here's a beautiful animation. So <laughs> <laughs> this is the, the dictionary, and uh, it disappears, and then it comes up again. And yeah, this is a visualization of the Germanic lexicon. So what I've done here is I've put all the, the entire Germanic language on one page, <coughs> and given the word to color, green is for Indian or internally Germanic uh, words. Uh, yellow words are words that only have cognates in the neighboring languages. So that those words are, are already at risk of not being in the European. Then there 
has an orange category, which uh, is, yeah, the orange, orange words are words only occurring in the Germanic itself, which is especially suspicious, of course. And then there's red words that have or actually have irregular features. And by those words, you can positively, positively say uh, this, these words cannot be in European in any way. And this is the picture, the picture you get. So, uh, well, there's a lot of green in it, as you realize, but there's also a lot of other colors, yellow, orange, and red. So, uh, yeah, it appears that Germanic is, well, to some extent, or to a larger extent, uh, a hybrid language from the, with a, a strong Indo-European element, or a strong, a strong Indo-European basis, but with the, an addition of uh, yeah, the lexical material from <laughs> other sources. Well, if you zoom into the red words or spots with a lot of a lot of red words, um, <laughs> what you well, let's take an example. This is uh, one spot. I hope it's I hope it's legible. Yeah, I think it's fine. Um, you can actually see that there is a, there, are, there there's a couple of semantic categories that are more dominant than others. So one of the categories is uh, bird named. Another uh, category is actually um, well agricultural word. So the, the word for uh, pea is in it. The word for bee stings. The word for the word to graze. And the third get category is about uh, metals, metallurgy, metallurgical terms. Let's take another spot. So another uh, spot is, well, uh, I've taken away the green words again. So what you find here is the word for bean, which is, again, strongly agricultural. Uh, and again, you find a metal word, a metal name, lead. And you also find a tree name. So it's local flora and fauna, uh, I, what I would call agricultural words, and then metallurgical words. So and with this, I think this is really the key to answering the question of the origin of the non indian European uh, component in Germanic, looking at the semantics. Um, because you, if you do this uh, systematically, you can clearly distinguish between a regular in the European layer that consists of typically in European words belonging to pastoralist culture, horses, wheels, wagon, the number, the word for father, the, the numbers, and then you get uh, well, a considerable, yeah, a strong layer of. Uh, what I would say Neolithic or Neolithic words containing words like hemp, pea, bean, sand, oats, carrots, and things like things like that. So what the the, the, the perspective that's that is opening up here is actually that yeah, if it's true that Neolithic words are overrepresented in non in European words in Germanic, this would be a strong indication that we are dealing with the language of the first in the first European farmers that moved all the way from Anatolia to Scandinavia. Recently there has also been found genetic evidence for this by researching uh, skeletons found in Sweden and comparing them to skeletons uh, yeah, the skeletons of, of, of the first farmers in Sweden and by comparing them to the skeletons of the, the hunter-gatherers that were still around there. Yeah, it's, it's possible to see a clear genetic difference. So there were actually two genetically distinct populations in Scandinavia, and it seems very likely that this is the result of an influx of farming uh, people from the south. So let's uh, look at the Neolithicization of uh, Europe. It started in uh, well, the Middle East, went through Anatolia, uh, Gre uh, Greece, the Balkans, and Central Europe, and ultimately uh, yeah, spread into Western Europe and Scandinavia. The situation that we get then is very complex. Um, we know from archaeology and uh, well, now also from genetics that uh, the, the, the introduction of uh, agriculture into Scandinavia uh, gave rise to a situation in which there were at least uh, two uh, peoples with two different subsist uh, subsistence uh, strategies, so farmers and 
hunter gatherers. They were living uh, beside each other for a well, very long time, maybe even longer than a millennium. And then in this uh, culturally and probably also linguistically diverse uh, situation, uh, the Indo-European speech was uh, inserted by the arrival of the Indo-Europeans. Um, yeah, so this is what's basically um, what I'm arriving at uh, at the moment, um, and what I'm mostly concerned with now, my what my research is focusing uh, on. Uh, yeah, the, my hypothesis that actually there was a farming population. <laughs> there was a farming population in uh, uh, Scandinavia, northern, northern Germany, before the arrival of. really based on the linguistic evidence, but it does add up to the genetic evidence and archaeological evidence. Uh, of course, this has uh, some uh, major ramifications, ramifications for the out of Anatolia hypothesis, as proposed by uh, Glenn Renfrew. Uh, Renfrew proposed that uh, Europe was Indo-Europeanized by the introduction of agriculture to Europe, so he actually uh, suggested that first farmers of Europe introduced the Indo-European languages, uh, well, obviously from the perspective, perspective of the Germanic lexicon, this is impossible, because if you have a regular Indo-European word with a very clear pastoralist terminology, and then a non-regular, non-Indo-European layer with agricultural words, uh, it's, 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 it's simply impossible to think that in European was taken to Scandinavia by the first farmers. And then, then the green words should have been red, and the red words should have been green. Another question uh, that I have for Renfrew is, where are all the terms for founder crops in the European? We've already seen a couple, so the, 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 the plants that were domesticated uh, first in the Middle East, uh, they are like the, the crops like pea, Veg, uh, lentil, garlic was also domesticated very early at a very early stage. But we don't have any, we don't have words for these things in the in the European. So where are they if in the European came from Anatolia? A strong, very strong case is uh, the word for pea. It's it's entirely irregular. And so you have the Germanic arabit and in Greek you have erebentos. Well, they are close and they almost mean the same. Germanic means pea, and Greek erebentos means chickpea. Um, but they, there's a complete formal mis mismatch. So e, if you have a word with e in Greek, it should have had e in Germanic as well, and not a, because a in Germanic usually corresponds to Greek o. And si similarly, the b in Germanic should have given, or the b in Greek should have given a Germanic p, and not a w. Uh, so there's several different uh, sounds irregularities here. And this um, obliterates, I think, the idea that we should reconstruct this word for Indo European. It's simply impossible to reconstruct the Indo European form. And it's clear why uh, because both Germanic and Greek borrowed the word from the first European farmers, and they did it independently and after their migration from the European, in the European homeland. There are other sh signs of shallow neolithization uh, of the Indo Europeans. Of course, Indo Europeans did know about, the, they, they did, ha did have some agriculture. For instance, they have the, the, there's a word for corn or grain. But again, it seems that they only became acquainted with this concept very late because it, in all the languages that we have, it also means uh, simply kernel or a small thing, not just grain or corn, the, the cereal. So it seems that they already had a word for kernel, and then they applied it to this new concept of uh, corn or grain, the cereal. You might notice that the Lithuanian, the Lithuanian company actually doesn't even mean grain, it means pea, which is also derivable from corn or kernel, of course. It's a small, round thing. And then, the, for instance, the word for pork that we have, or pig, uh, people usually use this word to claim that the European was highly or deeply agricultural. But if you look at all the cognates, you actually see that the Armenian word means hunting booty. So it could easily have 
being a, a wild boar they hunted and not a domesticated pig. So it seems to have started out as a as, as game and not as a domesticated pig. And I think all these, the, 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 this linguistic evidence all points to uh, what I think is a fact, namely that the Europeans only became acquainted with agriculture very late, at a very late stage, probably not too long before they started spreading from their homeland. Then uh, there is something I stumbled over while reading up uh, to this con conference, uh, and it was actually I was reading Milisauska's uh, book on uh, in European uh, in, uh, on European archaeology, and I found this very shocking uh, news. It's probably known to all archaeologists, but as a linguist, linguist I didn't know about this. And he stated that in the early Neolithic, that is the first wave of farming, farming was done using hoes and digging sticks. No evidence for plows has yet. Uh, oh, no evidence for plows has been found. So the first farms in Europe, they actually didn't have plows. To me, this was a very shocking thing. This is the first, the first thing when you think of when, you, when you're a farmer, is that they have plows, but that was obviously not. The problem is that in Europe, in European did have a word for plow. So you can easily reconstruct it. It's regular and it's there in several different, several, several different languages. So, if the first farmers didn't have plows, and the Europeans did did uh, did have a plow, word for plow, what does that mean? Well, I think uh, since the Europeans had plows, but their neolithicization was shallow or super superficial, it seems it is, they cannot they cannot have possibly have been the farmers responsible for the spread of the early Neolithic to northern Europe. Um, I would rather say that the Europeans were pastoralists that acquired farming techniques, including the plow during the middle Neolithic, when the plow was uh, being used uh, or was being invented. I guess. And then they took it, and then, they, and then only then, after that time, they moved into deeper into Europe, deeper into the, uh, the, the more Neolithic cultures that existed there, probably attracted by maybe the abundance of food. Um, I don't know how this, exactly how this might sound to the archaeologists, but this is the linguistic uh, evidence I've been trying to collect. I mean, uh, thank you for listening. I, yeah, you're welcome to comment. Let's talk. Thanks a lot. Um, I guess there will be comments and questions. Six thousand to five thousand uh, BC. Okay. 
And so then they actually have found a, a cloud there. Yeah. Well, they found they, they found uh, uh, pathological uh, articular surfaces on the legs of cattle, uh, okay. which indicate that the cattle were used for pulling a very heavy weight uh, behind them. And yeah. this is before the invention of the wheel. Yeah. So the best explanation for the would be uh, pathologies would be so this might mean that my last argument doesn't hold. Well, your last argument is really an attempt to uh, work around a difficulty. And uh, I think what I would say is that the difficulty is not really there. You mm -hmm. don't have to work around that. OK. Yeah. <laughs> but, you, but yeah, this is mainly because Milisauces claimed that there were no plows in the earliest phase of the Neolithic. Uh, yeah. uh, and if there, if there were, of course, then but the early uh, wait, wait, Jakob, Jakob, wait a minute. We have a list of speakers. David Anthony, you were first actually with the comment or question. That was my comment that okay. the plow, the plow uh, probably is there in okay. the Balkan Neolithic. And, okay. and if it was there in the Balkan Neolithic, it might well have spread <coughs> with uh, farming techniques through Europe. Therefore, it, it probably was there and there was some word mm -hmm. for it. No. Uh, in the Neolithic languages. Mary? Uh, so I've got to, in my own lecture, I'll come back to some of the things you're saying here. So I'm counting the uh, domesticated plants. I'm going to ask or try to make a, a general statement because I think it haunts an awful lot that we're dealing with here. And that is the relative layers of the languages that we're dealing with. As I think you rightly do it. You, you have Germanic at about 2,000 years ago. And if my understanding is right, Proto Germanic we can notionally set to about 500 BC or something like that. And we would probably do almost the same thing for Celtic, Italic, Baltic, and Slavic. In short, all of the proto languages from which we are gaining our knowledge basically are floating around in what we would call the Late Bronze Age and in the Iron Age. And for that reason, one would not even need Indo-Europeans throughout most of Central and Western or Northern Europe until the Late Bronze Age, from a theoretical point of yes, view. Yes, that's completely true, I think, yeah. Now, I, I know I'm handing one over to Christian, right? Christian. <laughs> OK, that's one thing. On the other hand, if we wanted to do the seriation of the languages we imagine are going on, European Mesolithic, I imagine, is a patchwork of non Indo European languages. We then have, starting from about 7000 BC in Greece to 4000 BC in northwestern Europe, the spread of Neolithic languages, probably. There may very well be an initial language coming in, one or two, but once acculturation begins, different Mesolithic populations are picking up Neolithic as well, and they're going to be contaminating, shall we say, whatever linguistic residue is. And it should have been three layers here. Right. Well, this is where the things are going to get, because I'm going back to Einhardt's thing here. And when, if we follow the step theory, we can't help but imagine that the Cordyware culture, possibly Beaker, something from around at least 3000 BC, if not earlier, is spreading into European languages across Europe. But at 3000 BC, that's removing them by probably 2000 years or more from mm -hmm. the proto languages that yeah, we are getting our yeah. evidence from. Yeah. And what we're doing is we're spreading an Indo European language that does not need to exist from a theoretical point of view or from a methodological point of view. And in, in it's also itself. one that we cannot really justify by the phylogeny of Indo-European. That is, we do not have a proto celto germano balto slavic italic How do we deal with that? Because when you're talking about the absorption of these yes. words, it's important to that. Exactly, is to know at what level these things are actually coming and swimming around in Europe and entering, which I imagine we we don't have to do any earlier than, let's say, about 1,000 BC or so. 1,000 BC is the absolute, uh, I say, yeah, last, latest uh, 
moment. But of course, we know from languages that they can be fairly stable for a millennia. For instance, Russian, it has been stable, hasn't really changed a lot for a thousand years or more, maybe even longer. Uh, so I don't think it's necessarily problematic from a linguistic perspective to assume a far deeper uh, or, uh, invasion of the Europeans. And as to um, the entrance of the non-Europeans, non-European words into these branches, I would say this is exactly proof, not only that the European wasn't a, the language of the first farmers, but also that they, they entered Europe in different groups. They must have adopted these words independently from each other. And well, uh, yeah, of course this destroys the Northwest uh, European hypothesis. The idea that there was a common uh, proto-language to both Slavic or maybe Germanic Celtic and Tel Celtic. There wasn't. There was no such language. They simply entered Europe independently. I, th I strongly, strongly believe. So, <laughs> this means we have two paradigms operating here: a, a late Bronze Age and a late Neolithic, early Bronze Age horizon for the expansion of Indo-European. And I, I find it fascinating because if you, if we want Indo-European, shall we say, in Scandinavia, 3000 BC, but we have no need for them there. So, for the first millennium BC, what in the world are we talking about from an Indo-European standpoint then? Uh, well, like I said, I mean, well, Germanic did actually change a lot, so it wouldn't be crazy to assume that they would have been there at an early stage. It's, it, I don't think it's impossible. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't, maybe you don't need them there linguistically, but it's no problem either to have them there. Well. I would say. But it's 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 uh, there's a lot yeah, there's a huge of course time gap between uh, well let's say court of Ware and yeah the first attestation of uh, European languages or Germanic. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, it was just uh, because of uh, but uh, wouldn't the early expansion of of um, the um, of new Neolithic agriculture be before there were plows in the Balkans about 10,000 years ago. That was, well, uh, that was what I thought was assumed by many people that there were the, the oh, initial. 10,000? No. Initial okay. agricultural. 8,000 BC? No. No. Okay. okay. I mean, I'm not going to speculate but on that. Anyway, it's really yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, you're thinking it's about in the Near East. Yeah. 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 yeah, in the Near East, yeah, but the expansion happens later. Yeah. You're, the dates you're giving are the origin of the Neolithic yeah. in, in uh, uh, the Neolithic. Wouldn't Rental uh, place the Indo-European uh, origins there in Anatolia? In Anatolia, about 7,000, 6,000. Yeah, yeah. That, that's still before the, the plow shows up, isn't it? Uh, certainly it's before the plow shows up in Anatolia. No, I, I just want to, to ask a question follow up upon Mallory because I mean you, you're talking about this time gap uh, and basically you are suggesting we, 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 we theoretically can have two models an early and a late. Mm -hmm. Now I think once you return the question to the linguist, is a linguistic black box that suggests that, that there should be something between proto Germanic, Italic and so on and the proto languages. Exactly. Is there linguistic grounds to suggest that there, sh there is a gap here that should be filled, but we don't have the evidence because we only have written evidence once these languages are, uh, are in existence as separate languages? Yeah, I think the problem is the phylogeny of the Indo European languages. Phlogistically, it behaves in a very strange way in which it's a starburst of different branches almost, rather than the types of shoots that would be, you know, you can find frequently in other language groups. Uralysis don't have nearly the same type of problem as Indo-Europeanists do, I think, in discussing, you know, the moving back from phase to phase to phase, all the way back to the proto-language. And so there is, yes, a blank, but it's not filled up by a, a a Northwest European is a geographical concept, perhaps more than it is a, uh, a phlogistic concept. I, I would say maybe, well, it's possible 
Well, all the linguistic sites, I think, point to a separate independent entry of Western Europe. That's my, stand, my point of view. Not, not just because of these uh, non-European uh, words, the adoption of those, but also because uh, I think it's impossible to reconstruct uh, some note. This is, it would have been, yeah, would have been pre-Kent, a Canton split, which is really weird, weird in the first place if you have a sub note like that. I have uh, two short comments. Uh, um This is, of course, the Mesolithic, the yeah, hunter-gatherers. Exactly. So this is, could be much earlier. Time, you have to yeah. series of uh, splits that follow each other chronologically. The Anatolian and then Tocharian and then Italo-Celtic and then the Northwest European ones coming on uh, later. You, know uh, you don't know what's going in between. The you don't know what's going in the rest yeah. and you don't know what that means in, in human or language terms. And it's very problematic since you have this quoted to our culture, which is already uh, huge. <laughs> okay, that's an illusion. A very, very short comment on that. One figure. One figure. What is the base figure for your 85%? Uh, my base figure? Well, it's my database. How many groups, in other words? It's almost 3,000 proto. 3,000 proto uh, forms. Okay, because for form you have 1,377. Right. Germanic protoforms, or what? Yeah, it is also old. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, thank you very much again. Um,